grateful that you braved the weather and has come to join us this morning for our discussion on rebranding the Republican Party. I know the, um, that there are, we had 96 RSVPs and we had the weather take a toll on that this morning, but we've, we're going to be broadcasting, we are broadcasting this, uh, uh, webcasting it live on the internet, and I know that, uh, so I wanted to welcome folks who are joining us over the web as well as those uh, here in person. This is too important a topic, I think, to, uh, to not hold, and I think the timing is, is quite appropriate as the inauguration last week and, and some of the uh, euphoria of that start to, to fade into the real difficult work that is before the nation. Uh, the uh, the two-party system, in fact, is alive and well, and uh, the Republicans are now taking a hard look at what their playbook can look like in the, in the face of a challenging few years. And so this event is to bring together some of the strong minds in town, both uh, on our panel with our keynote and with the audience, uh, to have a discussion a bit about what that might look like for the new, uh, the new year. There's a lot of interesting uh, information in the press around what the uh, situation is for the Republican Party. Uh, one of the most interesting uh, polls that I've seen recently is the Gallup uh, Compendium on Party Identification this past week interviewed 30,000 people, and it's very interesting to look at the numbers really since 2004, as one goes through Katrina and goes through uh, some of the 2006 election impact of the war, and then 2008 and the impact on the economy. You see this cleavage in party identification, which interviewees were listing as roughly identical Republican and Democrat in 2000, between 2001 and 2005, starting to split starting in 2005, so that the identification, self-identification uh, in 2008 was 36 to 28 for the Democrats. And so that is the context for which we hold this event uh, today. How the Republicans think about whether or not to become more combative or more um, uh, bipartisan, more uh, moderate, more conservative. Uh, I found that it was interesting watching the talk shows this past weekend and seeing Senator McCain on uh, Fox News and then uh, John Boehner on Meet the Press uh, talking a bit about uh, their attempts to, to both work with the new president the new congressional leadership, but also to try to find areas of disagreement and how serious those areas of disagreement will become uh, in the short term, medium term, and long term will be issues that I'm sure we'll discuss today. We're grateful to have uh, three experts in this uh, topic of politics, the Republicans, and the broader policy issues facing our nation. I'd first like to introduce Doug holtz Eakin, who's a good friend of New America and one of the great uh, policy leaders, certainly uh, in the Republicans over the past year, but generally in thinking about some of the key issues facing our nation in a context of the economy. Dr. holtz Eakin has a distinguished career in public service on a variety of areas. I'll just mention a couple. He was the sixth director of the Congressional Budget Office, which I think is very important given the current uh, pressing financial issues. Served as chief economist for uh, the President's Council of Economic Advisors earlier in this decade, and most recently served as director of the domestic and economic policy for the John McCain for President campaign. In a few moments, I'm going to invite Doug to come up and, and begin our discussion today uh, as he looks back now uh, with a little bit of perspective and a little bit of time on the lessons of the 2008 campaign, and what went right, what might have gone differently, and how he reflects on, um, on, on working with uh, Senator McCain and the Republicans generally. And then as we think uh, more broadly about what the Republicans are likely to do in the future or should do. Then afterwards, we have, are, are pleased that we have two respondents, uh, both fellows at New America, who have very interesting perspectives on the question before us today. Jim Pinkerton, who worked in the White House under Presidents Reagan and Bush 41, is a columnist for du Newsday, a contributor for Fox News, and uh, also a senior advisor to the Huckabee for President campaign. And then Rehan Salam, who's also a, a fellow here at New America, who's written in a variety of contexts, and most recently I'll just highlight his book, Grand New Party, which takes a very interesting perspective that's gotten a lot of attention on what the Republicans might do in order to regain a foothold in the political landscape. So with that, thank you for joining us today. I'd like to invite Doug holtz up to begin our discussion. Doug? Thanks, David, uh, and thanks to everyone for uh, making the effort to show up uh, today. It is on sort of fairly dismal weather circumstances. I appreciate it. Um, uh, I guess this, you know, David's trying to uh, uh, sort of assist my therapeutic recovery from the campaign. <laughs> this is the next important step. I, you know, began doing the usual things. I drank for a week and then I slept for a week and now I'm starting to try to talk about my experiences and share. So, um, 
Uh, I, I want to do have uh, reflect a little bit about how the campaign played out, but but first I want to uh, stipulate an important uh, caveat about all of these remarks, which is uh, I have been very lucky to have worked in two White Houses, been at the Congressional Budget Office, and then do the policy job in the McCain campaign. And uh, one of the rules that I've always had for myself, and then told my staff, is that you, you know to be successful, you should stick to your portfolio. I'm a PhD economist. I'm a policy analyst. Uh, I, I'm not a politician, and so. Uh, let the professional politicians do the politics. I'm now at an event that is about politics, and I'm about to sort of break my rule and, and talk outside my portfolio. And so forgive me in advance uh, for the, the sort of amateur speculation that I'm about to engage in. Um, so the first thing David wanted to talk about is sort of what happened. Um, uh, and to the best of my uh, ability to remember, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, I think there's some important you know, aspects of the campaign that I think everyone knows. I mean, the first of all is that uh, it was a, uh, a race run in the context of a very unpopular president, uh, a, a race run in the context of a very unpopular party whose congressional performance uh, had been far from stellar, uh, and uh, as a result, the brand had been diminished uh, quite quite remarkably. And uh, the the party's self-identification was one of the things that stood out in the course of the. The campaign. I mean, bluntly, had the McCain campaign been uh, uh, in the business of running the Bush Cheney playbook and turning out uh, the Republican base in order to win, we couldn't have won. There simply were not enough self identified Republicans for us to, to do that and win. And as a result, the, the crucial issues became where could uh, the, the campaign find uh, and, and make some ability to attract independents and, and even Democrats. Uh, in the course of, of doing the, the campaigning. And, and that turned out to be just a tremendous challenge. And uh, I think uh, one of the things that showed up very clearly was that economic events during the campaign just colored our ability to do that outreach. And, and in the end, uh, you know, the biggest example of that is the financial crisis that came uh, shortly after the convention. You know, right after the convention, we uh, had a post-convention bump. Uh, we were actually leading in the polls. And then the Wall Street meltdown began. And basically what went on is that every time Wall Street went through another uh, uh, terrible, terrible uh, fit, uh, people looked backwards to try to understand how did we get in this position. Anytime the electorate was looking backwards, uh, they were looking at uh, a diminished brand of Republicans and an unpopular president, and we were in trouble. Anytime we could talk about the future and change the debate to talk about the future, we did better. And uh, in the end, uh, we had a minor rally in the last two weeks, um, which uh, was about uh, uh, the future and, and what were the values that were going to infuse economic policy. Uh, they were delivered somewhat uh, miraculously, if that's a proper term, by a guy named Joe the Plumber. It's not really his name, but he's Joe the Plumber to everyone now. Uh, but he actually changed that debate to be about the future, and, and we saw the, the, the race tighten one more time. Uh, but as we approached Election Day, it turned out uh, that, that it was back to being a turnout election. Uh, if you looked at the, the setting uh, two weeks out from the election, uh, what our polls told us was that uh, this election had the greatest intensity, uh, and potentially the greatest intensity ever. Uh, that these intensity measures, measured on a scale of 100, uh, the, the strongest on record was the 2004 election, 75 on election day. Two weeks out, it was a 74, and all the indications were that this would be uh, the most closely and intensely uh, participated election. Our, uh, our math was real simple then. Uh, if Barack Obama got the folks that he thought would turn out, which would be to see African Americans, the youth vote, to turn out disproportionately, that was his game plan. If you looked at where he spent his money, he spent his money on the ground. It, it was clear that if you, you looked at how they viewed the election, it was we have the votes, we simply have to turn them out. Our view was we had to find the votes and turn them out. The intensity was the key to doing that. Uh, and had we gotten comparable intensity out of the traditional Republican electorate on Election Day, we would have gotten a sort of standard turnout model and have been a very close election, but we had a shot. Uh, it didn't happen. Uh, in the end, uh, the turnout was disproportionately the way the, the Democrats wanted it to be, and the election uh, went with it. And indeed, we didn't win a key battleground state. And I think that's the most striking uh, 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 sort of uh, piece of evidence that's there. Uh, what did that turnout look like? Well. Uh, if you look at the exit polls, uh, I read them and, um, you know, my, my depression deepens and I don't want to do another week of drinking, but um, uh, we lost every age group except the 65 and older. 
Uh, we lost uh, every minority group in the racial demographics. Uh, we lost um, uh, basically uh, working women, and the only uh, uh, female segment we won are uh, married women without kids. And um, we lost at every level of education. We lost the college graduates. Um, we lost male college graduates making more than $200,000, uh, which was a, a, a quite striking finding. And uh, geographically, we lost uh, everywhere but in the South, and we lost uh, all the urban cities. So um, uh, in terms of exit polls, there's a lot there that suggests that uh, the party was not reaching broadly into the electorate and was not appealing uh, in, in many ways. And uh, since then, there, there's been a lot of talk about how uh, what we need to do is return to the playbook uh, Ronald Reagan ran uh, and, and get back to that. Uh, I would stipulate that that's not an answer. Um, uh, I am now uh, old, um, and I was around and had hair when Ronald Reagan uh, uh, was so successful. Uh, some key characteristics of that era were uh, uh, strikingly high inflation and uh, chronic high inflation, uh, chronic high unemployment, low productivity growth. It was a, an era of economic uh, malaise. And uh, it, there's a great book out by Robert Samuelson called The Great Inflation and its Aftermath. Uh, I commend all of you to read it. It describes the policymaking errors of that era and, and how it uh, led us to that situation. Uh, it was an era on the international front where America was wondering if it was still a superpower. And uh, it was an, an era in which social conservatives felt they had no voice and, and were not represented in the public policy debate. Uh, I would stipulate that's not where we are now. Uh, we are the only superpower on the planet. Uh, we have an active participation by social conservatives. Uh, no one's worried about inflation. We have good productivity growth. We have uh, different problems. But I think going back and simply saying, gee, it's just like then, we should go forward is a mistake. It, the setting's different, and uh, we need to uh, accomplish a different set of objectives. Um, uh, we have to certainly address the issues in, in the dem dem demographic appeal, uh, the income, and the, the geographic issues. We need to uh, be more appealing and open to a broader demographic. Uh, we certainly, I think, came away from the campaign, which is Republicans need a message on how they're going to help the middle class. As a party, we do not, did not have a quick, compelling answer to how are you going to help the middle class? And in the end, uh, I think that was a, a, a really uh, a crippling deficiency in the campaign. And uh, w we need to have a message toward uh, urban areas. Um, and we do not have that as a party. So we need to, to address those. Uh, one of the temptations, of course, when, when you, you sort of start thinking about this stuff is you, you, know, you, you, you lose track of your roots entirely. And I think that's one mistake not to make. There are things that may be, need to be preserved and strengthened in the Republican brand. Uh, the notion of the United States as a unique place on this planet with a commitment to freedom is something we should never stray from. Uh, the historic strength of the party in national and now homeland security and, and uh, uh, the, the physical freedoms and safety of our, um, of our citizens is important. Uh, it's been a party that has uh, carried the torch of personal responsibility and the rewards that come from individuals uh, taking risks. And, and I think those are good things. Uh, and we should uh, make the case that along with that, we should continue to have a small contained government low taxes. But we do need to do some things that are a little bit different within that context. Um, number one, I think we have to have a greater tolerance for differing visions, social and economic divisions uh, within the party. Uh, to my eye, at least, uh, one of the things that I saw happening, uh, particularly in the Congress uh, and um, uh, in the party during uh, the early part of the Bush administration, is this notion of passing only bills that were supported by a majority of the majority and turning Republicans into clones and cookie cutters of one another, uh, that the party would always be united and always be the same in legislative action. It did a couple of things. Uh, number one, uh, if you cannot make the case that you can broker individual differences within the party, uh, you are unable as a result to genuinely broker differences outside the party and, and undertake uh, bipartisan e efforts. That's important because there will be no major reforms of things that matter, the tax code, Social Security, Medicare, 
energy policies that are not genuinely bipartisan. They, they, you cannot do those large reforms on a partisan basis. So I think that hurt the brand. Second thing they did for voters, it said, well, all these Republicans are alike. So if I don't like one of them, let's get rid of all of them. And uh, that's a, a very tenuous place to be as a party. Uh, and the third thing it did was to say, well, gee, if we really do have differences, uh, but we don't want to appear on the surface to have differences, how are we going to, to, to solve this? Well, th they solved it uh, by, by turning into uh, the party of earmarks and uh, special interests and uh, the corruption it led to both uh, politically and ultimately uh, legally is, is a great stain on the party. And I think uh, we have to change course and move away from that. We cannot be a party that is so beholden to particular interests uh, in economic policy in particular. We have to restore the integrity. And part of the integrity is tolerating differences and others being respectful uh, of their visions. Um, one of the things I think that would deliver for us is a movement that is more interested in the, the real economy, the manufacturing base, the, 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 the domestic production that matters so much, and less uh, tilted toward the financial sector, uh, which has had so much of a top priority in international trade agreements and in economic policy making uh, for the past decade. Uh, and that pro-manufacturing uh, bent would generate a prism through which you can look at tax reform, health care reform, and other items that I think would be beneficial in addressing concerns of the middle class about the future of the Republican Party. But most importantly, I think, what the party needs to do is, is decide that when it has a small and contained government, what that government ought to do. And it is time for Republicans to be for some things uh, in terms of not just national defense and the government delivering that, that perfectly appropriate role, but uh, a, a new social contract that is appealing to the middle class in particular. Uh, it was thoroughly depressing to me as the policy director to look at polling data that suggested not only did uh, the American public think that Republicans weren't for health care reform, they actually believed that Republicans didn't want people to have health insurance. That's just unbelievable. Of course Republicans want Americans to have health insurance. We, we disagree greatly with the Democrats on how to deliver this effectively, but of course we would like them to. We are perceived as against the kinds of things that Americans value, which is some insulation from the financial cost of catastrophic illness. And uh, we need to be for health care reform. It will be an issue uh, uh, from now to the foreseeable future until we address it. Republicans need to engage in that. And uh, we, we had, I think, a, a very effective uh, health care reform proposal on the campaign, uh, which no one heard about, largely because, uh, especially this group, right? In Northern Virginia, uh, Barack Obama outspent us a gazillion dollars to one. That's an estimate. Um, uh, and, and official uh, the CBO official estimate, um, uh, and, and we really never got that message out. Uh, we need to be for education reform uh, and, and serious education reform because the, the failure of the inner city schools of America is a civil rights disgrace and an economic handicap. And it is time for us to, to take the message to the people that we are tired of wasting the lives of some of America's most valuable resources, which are uh, our youth and our future and uh, that this is not merely about uh, being against unions or something like that. It is about being for the kids of America and uh, send that message. We, we certainly, I think, have to have a coherent and proactive message on energy and the environment. Uh, you know, I, I think Americans are tired of being held hostage to international oil markets. Republicans are perceived as defending uh, the use of oil far too much. Um, and I think crafting a message that is respectful of uh, oil's place for the foreseeable future, there's, there's no way around that math, uh, but which is, takes on the issue of what our energy portfolio should be, both more independent of uh, the fluctuations in the price of oil and cleaner in, in a broad way, I think would be far more appealing to both uh, demographic constituencies in the United States and our ability to, to work with international par parties. And lastly, uh, uh, we still have uh, two pressing crises at the federal level, Medicare and Social Security, which have been uh, unresolved for years, uh, where the Republican contribution has been to make the Medicare financial problem worse with the drug bill, not better. And uh, we need to have a message 
that is about having those programs be preserved for the future and more efficient and is not simply about making them go away. And uh, I think that portfolio, the, the notion that we need to be for things which are an efficient social contract where the government has a role but it is, is carefully crafted uh, is something that uh, broadly is, is not identified with the Republican Party and that if we are to be successful in broadening our appeal either across the income distribution, across different parts of the demography, and in particular uh, across the geography, we're going to have to uh, look toward uh, new ideas, be a party where crazy ideas can be entertained, maybe not embraced, but uh, where, where certainly we, we lose the perception that the Republicans are not interested in ideas. Somewhere along the way, Republicans who had made the correct observation that you didn't have to go to Harvard to be smart and that you could have gone to the University of Nebraska or many other places and been just as smart as the people who went to Harvard, that message got tra translated into, we don't need to be smart. We, we have the values of common people and, and we can be anti-ideas. And in too many cases, uh, that is the, the label that has stuck. That's a damaging label for a party that has been about ideas historically and needs to be about ideas in the future. Uh, and so by embracing greater tolerance of ideas, we can embrace, I think, a, a greater uh, ability to attract different uh, aspects of the, the, the electorate. So um, as I said, uh, these are uh, hardly what I would call uh, hard science or even probably uh, views that have much perspective. Uh, getting perspective on uh, something like what I've done for the past uh, literally three years. I wrote my first memo about a potential McCain campaign in December 2005. Um, uh, I don't think I have a great deal of perspective on that, but I do think the party's had an important moment. I think a U-turn toward uh, rerunning the playbook of, of the 1980s uh, would not be successful in the end, and that a thoughtful rethinking of uh, the, the, uh, the party would be to our advantage. Uh, it's often said that the United States is a center-right country governed by a center-left elite, and um, there's a lot of truth to that. And I guess if you had to distill this to a soundbite, uh, I would like the Republican Party to remember that it's a center-right country uh, and that we should respect that center. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doug. That's going to provide a lot of food for thought for Q&A here in a few minutes. And uh, to add to that food for thought, um, I'm grateful that uh, Jim Pinkerton and Rehan Salon are here as respondents. I'm going to invite Jim to, uh, to join us here uh, at the podium. Why don't you come up for, for that? Um, I think it's easier for the folks on, on watching it on the web. Thanks, Jim. Great, thanks. <coughs> Um, well, I think as a Republican, uh, we should just say in terms of restoring the Republican brand um, up front on, on simple competence, the Republican Party very much deserved to lose uh, last year. I think John McCain was a good candidate. I think Sarah Palin was a good candidate. Um, but the party overall just, just had an obvious uh, failure and the voters, uh, you know, Render their judgment. Um, you know, I think the, the usual suspects of the, the, the handling of the Iraq War, uh, Katrina and the bailout, and I'm sure during the Q's and A's, Doug will have a chance to talk about his own perspective on the bailout. I, I, I think the bailout was a mistake. I think it was a mistake for McCain to, before it. And I think that'll be a major dividing line um, in the future uh, inside the Republican Party. And, uh, you know, every day now, when you read about John Thane's bathroom and city groups, Jet and AIG's vacations, and it's on and on and on and on. Uh, people who used to think, well, that's just the private sector's free right to waste their own money, uh, now they're wasting our money. And this will be a major issue. Um, I think, as I said, on competence, the Republican Party deserved to lose. On values and beliefs, I actually think we'll, uh, we'll more than hold our own um, in the next few years. I would. Uh, Remind uh, this audience that the gay marriage uh, streak 31 for 31 across the country, um, and the fact that even now uh, Nancy Pelosi is militant and says, "Oh, of course, contraception will be in the stimulus package because, of course, that's because eugenics, a la China, is stimulative." Uh, and then apparently this morning they're backing out of that. So just as a reminder, you know, don't fool with uh, the center-right country on and issues they care about. Uh, um, you'll lose. Um, 
earlier, uh, just a couple months ago, uh, David convened a, a, a group on the Re Republican Party and his future, and Chris Hayes, who was no Republican, who was a certified, I guess, leftist, I'm sure he'd be happy to say, uh, he's the bureau chief of the Nation magazine, said, you know, as I think about this bailout, I am feeling, quote, almost Austrian. Now, that's a clear reference, and I asked him afterwards just to make sure, to the Austrian economists, this is Hayek and von Mises and Schumpeter and all the rest of them, who were fierce critics in the middle of the last century about big government socialism planning, the road to serfdom, and so on and so on. And so for, 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 for the, you know, and again, I think now as we look at the bailout, you see that, it, that the coalition is libertarians and Dennis Kucinich uh, on the libertarian and, and left, and there's a broadband of, you know, George Bush to Barack Obama uh, in the middle to support the bailout. Um, and again, that's going to be a fierce dynamic. Uh, the burden on the people who say uh, the 700 billion for TARP and 800 billion for stimulus and trillions on top of that, uh, the burden on them is to show can work. And uh, I'm a little skeptical uh, myself. I, my own view is that we're in a period sort of like after the Civil War, when there was the Republicans controlled everything, and the big issue then was railroads. And uh, you know the, the, the railroad ex my, number of miles I looked this up expanded tenfold from 1850 to 1890. Uh, in that process, it was unbelievable amounts of corruption. We were you know clearing away the Indians, clearing away settlers, clearing away you know small businessmen, anybody else, anything that got in the way of railroad expansion. Uh, you know E. e. H. Harriman and whoever would go and just buy the entire legislature, some state to to, to do it. Uh, it was corrupt. Some would say necessary. Uh, some would say without a doubt, economically beneficial, but it was a brutal process that spawned the populist movement, the progressive movement, uh, and uh, enormous, enorm and, uh, the, the Tilden uh, insurrection inside the Democratic Party um, over and over again. I think that is what's going to come next on this. Um, D Doug mentioned uh, the 1970s and how we're not in the 1970s. Well, with all due respect, I will yeah. unveil this. And again, I'm Doug can explain this infinitely better than I can. This, it's a little hard to see. This blue line here is money supply. And this was 1985, this is 2000. And you can, can barely see it because it, there's a gray band for recession. But you see that the gray bands all across here are recessions or depressions, I guess. And the blue line is money supply. And it went from here to here in six months, or whatever that is. Uh, now, the, 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 the definition of, again, Doug is infinitely more eloquent on this than I am, of, of you know, what made me a Republican, frankly, uh, was stagflation, slumpflation. We had all sorts of names for it back then, uh, Carterism, uh, where you had un rising unemployment and rising inflation. And people would say, oh, the source of inflation is businessmen, business charging too much. And then if, if Milton Friedman, who was still alive back then, would say, no, actually, it's the money supply. If you print money like crazy, you get inflation. You know, we'll be pushing our, our paychecks in wheelbarrows, uh, uh, like in Germany, if we're not careful. Um, so I think that is going to be, in a grim way, a major tonic to the Republican Party if, and again, as I said, the bailout is a huge, a tarp is a, is, a, is, a, is a huge dividing line here, if we are back into the 1970s here. And I must say, uh, as, I, as I watch Barack Obama, you know, I'm old enough to remember 1990, 1993, and believe it or not, 1977, when the Democratic president said, I got elected. I'm here to change things in Washington. And the barons of Capitol Hill said, well, we got elected too. And according to Article One of the Constitution, blah, blah, blah. And Tip O'Neill in 1977 and Tom Foley in 1993 said, listen, you have your ideas about tax cuts and whatnot and whatnot. We're not going to do any of that stuff. We're going to spend more money. And they did. And uh, Carter paid the price for it, and, and Clinton, at least, well, actually, in the case of 1993 and 1994, the Democrats themselves paid the price for it. Um, just for fun, I was watching all this news about, you know, Pelosi and, 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 and uh, Harry Reid saying, oh, we're not going to have tax cuts. Don't be silly. That, that's just silly talk. And I, so I just, for my own amusement, I created, and I went to GoDaddy and registered it, businessasusualindex.com. Um, and I, I quoted Robert Schlesinger uh, saying, as an example of, of, of business as usual, well, you know, we're going to have a new ethics rule against lobbyists coming into the government, except when we don't have one. And so hence uh, William Lynn at the, at the Defense Department and uh, William Corr 
at HHS. Well, again, if, if people voted for hope and change and, and all that stuff, and they don't get it, uh, they'll be trouble. Now, so lest it just seem like this is a partisan attack on them, uh, uh, I would just say this, what will the Republicans have to do? And, and, and I would just say a couple things. Casual observation of the weather out there suggests that global warming is not the greatest crisis this, this world faces. Uh, um, and I know I'll sound like a know-nothing to some, but there's plenty of scientists who say actually the O's were, have been cooler than the 90s. Uh, the Pew Center, Pew Center has invested heavily in global warming as their big cause, and they have a study that shows environmental concerns at the bottom. Um, if Barack Obama really means it and says that we're going to have electric cars that don't pollute and that drive 100 miles, 100, you know, don't pollute, so it doesn't matter how many miles a gallon they get, uh, and they decrease our dependence on foreign oil, then great. But if it just seems like a way to destroy the auto industry, which is I sort of think has been sort of the objective of a substantial chunk of the left in the last 30 or 40 years, uh, then not so great. And they'll pay a, they'll pay a huge political price for it. Um, I would advise the Republicans to fight Kyoto, fight cap and trade, fight global warming, fight trillion dollar tax increases to the death. Uh, I just, I would, I would advise them to say, look, the Chinese, the Indians, the Vietnamese, the Mexicans, they're not part of this. The glo whole global warming thing is uh, a, a marriage of convenience between liberal environmentalists in the Northeast and the West Coast of America and Northwestern Europe, and that's about it. And if we're, you know, in a world where, you know, the Chinese are floating navies now in the Indian Ocean and the Indians, of course, are, and there's great power competition all over the world, and we're sitting there, you know, burning our, burning our fleets like the Chinese did in the 15th century, well, I think that is a poor plan. I, I agree with Doug that, you know, national security and the st strong defense are a big part of the Republican brand, and I can't quite believe that uh, the Obama administration wants to throw that away in terms of national power, but uh, we shall see. If they do, then... So be it. Um, and I would also say I would agree with Doug on intellectualism. Uh, uh, you know, the Republican Party, uh, historically, conservatism, you know, I mean, Thomas Aquinas, Burke, these people were smart, smart, and they read books and they wrote books, and if not everybody understood them, that was fine with them. Uh, they weren't really trying to, you know, uh, 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 you know ideas of consequences. Uh, John Weaver, uh, not John Weaver, uh, Richard Weaver. Uh, uh, you know, these people weren't at all interested in what the mass, they, they, they frankly looked down on the masses. Now, that's also the wrong approach, but it's just somewhere in there you need room in your movement for brainy people to discuss. And Rehan has written, I think, a brilliant book on a, or co-written on the, the future of the Republican Party as a more working class, Joe the Plumber-ish party, and I very much look forward to what he has to say. Thank you. Hi, everyone. We have a lot of interesting issues to talk about. Um, I agree with Doug so much that I feel a little silly. I'm just going to amplify his remarks to some extent. But I want to begin. There was a debate between Austin Goolsby uh, and, and Doug uh, late in the campaign that I thought was very interesting and very frustrating to watch. One thing that you saw that McCain do, particularly on health care, was take a kind of broad consensus of kind of sober centrists and push through a plan that did involve some tough changes, tough but necessary changes that would lead to a more sustainable system that would broadly contain a lot of the features, the essential features that lots of middle class um, Americans like about their healthcare system as it exists, but that would also expand ownership without doing it in an excessively centralized kind of way. And then you saw the Obama campaign very effectively demagogue the plan, uh, talk about how it would endanger people's existing health care, and that their proposal would not change anything at all other than making everything better in some, you know, kind of entirely magical way. But what frustrated me was watching uh, Doug deal with uh, Austin, and he was bobbing and weaving, because the Obama campaign very effectively tweaked their policies, they tweaked their positions repeatedly throughout the campaign. I think Doug will agree with this. And uh, part of the reason they were able to do this is because of the depth of their bench. And also because of their sense that, you know, frankly, 
the person in the electorate, you know, kind of the, the median voter, isn't going to pay attention to the fact that, yeah, they're tweaking the healthcare plan iteratively as they respond to Republican attacks. It's going to be a handful of people in Washington think tanks, frankly, and, and academic departments who are going to note this. And they're so sympathetic to the Obama campaign as it is that they're not exactly going to be upset about it. So, I mean, it's something that you really need to do in that kind of environment. I mean, policy and politics have to be tightly integrated. But, you know, to do that effectively, again, you need that deep bench. And the problem with that deep bench goes back to another broad issue that Doug was talking about, namely that there are a lot of people I know in their late 30s, uh, you know, late, mid 40s, you know, friends of mine, who are people who are very much part of this pragmatic center. Uh, and they are instinctive Republicans. They're National Review subscribers. They uh, think of themselves as rock rib movement conservatives, even if they're a little heterodox here or there, even if they're pro-choice, even if they kind of, you know, uh, don't toe the line in some significant way. If these people were 25, they would, I promise you, all be Democrats. I mean, sort of, I know people who are very similar to them who are all working on the Obama transition. These are people who rankle whenever they hear people complain about outsourcing, that kind of thing. But I also think that there's a tendency to kind of overestimate the value of this group. Now, it is very important in terms of having that deep bench, uh, in terms of kind of uh, policy. It is very important. When you have a movement that is politically dominant, it's able to say, as Barack Obama has said, if you have a better idea, I'm open to it. Because there's a level of intellectual self-confidence, uh, you know, that comes from actually seeing, you know, feeling as though history is on your side. And when you feel as though you're part of a minority, or at least a minority in the intelligentsia, there's a kind of crabbed marginality and a defensive posture that happens that becomes very dangerous in terms of being able to gin up these new ideas. Talking to some of my friends on the McCain campaign, I was struck, you know, late in the primary stage, um, about how many of them felt that, well, first of all, as in any campaign, you're just dealing with the tyranny of the inbox. You're not able to do a lot of the strategic thinking that you're hoping to do. But not only that, there are so many powerful voices. Um, when you look at where Republican primary voters are, Republican elites are, when Republican uh, donors are, in terms of what the priority should be, what the policy priority should be, versus even, uh, you know, sort of the mainstream Republican electorate, the ones who are less intense, they vote in general elections, or certainly relative to the general electorate, there is a big, big gap. There was an NPR poll conducted by a Republican pollster, Glenn Bolger, who did this really amazing thing. What he did is he took a couple of different policies on national security, taxes, general economy issues. And what he did is he stripped away the partisan label. And then he asked <laughs> voters of different partisan stripes, what do you think of this mix of policies? When you had the partisan label on Republican tax policy, a large majority of self-identified Republicans liked Republican tax policy. When you stripped away the partisan label, a, a narrow majority, about 51% of self-identified Republicans liked the unlabeled off-brand democratic tax policy, um, which tells you something significant about the, the changing composition of the Republican electorate and how responsive Republican elites have been to that. Because again, you know, one great triumph of the post-Reagan Republican Party is that you have this rich infrastructure, uh, this rich ideological infrastructure, think tank infrastructure that's been very valuable in some respects, but that also, you know, involves lots of people talking to themselves. They talk to each other. There's an echo chamber. And you certainly see that happen on the left too. But it's something that is, I mean, in terms of the intellectual climate a little bit dangerous. But so to this other argument about, well, where are the opportunities? Where are the ducks that Republicans should be hunting? There is this kind of emerging consensus in Washington, and I think a lot of this is projecting your own sensibilities and kind of who your own friends are, mm -hmm. but that the focus should be on upper middle class, college educated folks uh, living in places like uh, southwestern Connecticut, uh, the suburbs of Philadelphia, et cetera. Look at Pennsylvania, though. Uh, Philadelphia, there's been a real erosion uh, among Republicans, but in Erie, Pennsylvania, there have been huge gains uh, for Republicans. Now, you know, granted, Erie is a shrinking, aging area, and Philadelphia is, you know, stable. I mean, it's sort of it's shrinking too, albeit at a slower pace. Um, and, you know, when you look at the northeast of Pennsylvania, that's another area that has a big, lit growing Latino population and was pretty evenly balanced and seems to be tilting over to the other side. It's interesting to look at this because. You know, as a state like Virginia, as a state like North Carolina, as th these states come into play, it partly reflects a redistribution of voters. We've seen this happen before. As California moved to the left, it moved to the left in part because of outmigration of folks to the Intermountain West, and those states became more conservative for a time. You could be seeing a world now in which states like Minnesota and Wisconsin ought to be a lot friendlier to Republicans, and when you actually see the results in 2008, Republicans overperformed in Minnesota relative to where they were performing elsewhere in the country. 
again, overperforming means you still lost by a big margin, but you lost by less than you should have given the company. Again, that was the state that in 84 was the lone holdout, along with the district, for the Democrats. So the map is changing in really significant ways that I think it's important for Republicans to catch up with. We think of the Republicans as the party of the, the South and, uh, you know, kind of the Great Plains, the so-called Republican L. But there are potentially some opportunities in a state like New Jersey, for example, where this guy Steve Lonigan, who's running uh, in the uh, primary for governor, he's a pro-lifer, but who's also won a lot of interesting ballot initiatives that introduced slightly heterodox economic ideas that are more middle class friendly. He's an interesting animal, and you wonder if that's something we're going to see more of uh, on the Republican side. If you look at these three legs of the, the, the Republican stool, as Mitt Romney called it, a kind of silly phrase, but we'll stick with it for now, you look at foreign policy, economics, and family values. And think about whether these have been a strength or a weakness for Republicans over the past decade or two. Foreign policy, I think we can agree, has been a strength for a long period of time and now might have turned into a weakness, at least in the kind of short, medium term. It certainly was in 2006 and 2008. If you look at family values, this is a little more controversial, but broadly speaking, given the, in, the relative intensity of socially conservative voters versus socially liberal voters, it seems to have actually been a strength. And again, a strength that has actually redistributed the electorate, such those Rockefeller Republicans in Philadelphia don't feel at home in the Republican Party anymore, but there are a lot of gains as well. Uh, the Republicans became the party of married white Christians. But on economic issues, there has been persistent weakness. And this is something that I think a lot of Republicans misunderstand. Yes, the tax cutting message has worked at various times, but there is this fundamental question, are you on our side? And you know, one of my favorite little numbers from the exit polls, 60% of Americans didn't think that McCain was in touch with their economic problems. And if you look at those Americans who thought that John McCain wasn't in touch with their economic problems, something like 7% of them voted for John McCain. So it really becomes mathematically impossible for you to win an election when you have that situation at hand. I remember when you know, lots of grassroots Democrats were really upset about Sarah Palin. I thought to myself, the Democrats need to just keep talking about John McCain's seven houses. They need to keep talking about how he just doesn't actually fit. He hasn't had a conventional experience of economic life. Uh, and that's going to really, really work very well for them. So you know, the question is, how do you talk about these issues? Is it a matter of candidate recruitment, having people who seem more plausible, more accessible in some way? Or is it just a matter of actually talking about the issues people really care about? As you know, Doug was suggesting, marginal tax rates, you know, there's diminishing returns to that. But then when you look at a whole panoply of middle class issues, you know, Reagan, when he you know, was pushing his, his tax cut, and sort of, or when you look at Jack Kemp and these guys, 78, 79, the median family you know, was paying a huge share, double digit share of their income in federal income taxes. Now that's less than 6%. So it's a, le a lot less salient to people than healthcare and a basket of other issues. But again, what was the principle at work? What was the underlying principle? It was this idea that there was a tax burden that was making it harder for middle class families to get ahead. So now, and I think Doug was speaking to this, what are the barriers for working class and middle class people who want to get ahead? It's a different set of barriers. To Jim's point about uh, climate change, I actually think that you've seen dramatic strides in the party. I was listening to John Boehner on the radio, and he was asking about climate change, and, and he said, you know, this is real, it's a problem, we care about it. But we have to look at what are the proposed solutions? Do they make economic sense? Are they sane? Do they respond to the actual scale of the problem? And I'm a real believer in climate change. I think it's real. I think it's a really, really serious problem. But I also think that in terms of the kind of mainstream debate around it, I think that it is very, very narrow. And I think that there's a danger, given we're going through a global economic downturn, are we going to see a carbon price? Is that the right way to approach it? Or does it make sense to actually make alternative sources of energy much cheaper through kind of smart, you know, kind of uh, approaches? a DARPA for energy, something like that, you, you know, small scale ways that we can actually tilt things in the right direction rather than try to remake the economy in one fell swoop, that actually has complicated strategic effects as well. When you look at Kyoto and sort of the, the divisions on that issue, demographics predict it perfectly. That is, Germany is going to have a shrinking population. Their carbon intensity is you know, pretty low, but their overall carbon emissions will simply decline. I mean, it's just going to happen when you don't have any babies. And so you know, I think that that's one thing that actually people kind of mistake and sort of it's an area where the United States and India and China actually have more in common and where we really need to be the leaders in, in crafting a solution, but it has to sort of get outside the box of thinking purely in terms of a carbon price. There's a lot of other stuff to talk about, but I imagine you guys have questions for Doug, so thank you very much.
Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> I'd love to listen to all three of these individuals uh, individually, and I knew putting them together on a panel would be magic, and indeed it is. And before, um, before we open it up to your questions, I want to uh, take prerogative to, to, to ask uh, a question of each of our, our panelists, um, starting with Doug and then our two respondents. Just putting on my hat is uh, having done brand management at Procter & Gamble uh, 15 years ago on, on cough cold products. I think about the brand, and as you're thinking about the message, the messenger, and the and the context, I wanted to ask a, a question of each of our, our, our speakers, starting with, with Doug, who I think talked very eloquently uh, and passionately um, about uh, the, the message and in thinking about healthcare, education, uh, the environment and energy, and entitlement reform. I wanted to ask him to drill down a little bit more uh, as he thinks about uh, the receptivity to where the party is now to that kind of message, what kind of, of discussions he's willing to share it they had on the, on the campaign about doing something um, more aggressive on, on those particular um, those particular areas and um, and what kind of, of, of thinking uh, he would advise the the future uh, uh, congressional leaders as they are the loyal opposition and, and develop their um, their strategic plan or do, do you need to wait until um, uh, you know a, a future uh, uh, you know the crisis becomes worse you know we, we may not be in the the area where the party can be as aggressive in these ideas maybe it should should hold back a little bit so I'd like him to talk for a moment about the the message itself and and how they might go about crafting it or any other lessons from the campaign on, 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 that, on that message? Uh, so it's a good question and um, uh, several several aspects of the answer. So from the perspective of the campaign, you know, one of the most striking uh, realizations I came away was uh, just how hard it was to convey to the American people uh, positions, mm -hmm. messages. I mean, it is really hard to break through and get people's attention and try to convey what you're for. I, I was stunned. Um, you know, I started full time on the campaign January 1, 2007. Uh, you know, we, we put together uh, the then presumptive Republican nominee, a, a, a first class campaign that took him from first to last and um, spent $23 million in the process. And, and then we put together uh, a glorified high school hockey team, uh, which uh, somehow secured the Republican nomination earlier than anyone had ever done. Um, and I had done nothing but talk nonstop the entire time. And so I got to, to June of, of 2008, and we're looking at some polling data, and people have no idea what John McCain's position is on anything. And it was just an incredible realization that it is very difficult to simply explain to 300 million people what you're for and against and why. So in terms of receptivity of message, one of the problems that we face, I think, as a party is we haven't laid the groundwork. Right? If you're going to talk about health care, you can't invent the message in the middle of a presidential campaign and expect to get enough bandwidth to convey a very complicated topic to, to a lot of people. Uh, if you're going to have a, a vision of uh, what is from a policy perspective, a very complicated interlocking set of efforts on education and health care and a variety of issues, uh, that can't be something you do post-convention for the stress run. It, it just won't work. Instead, what you'll do is you'll say, what do they know about us? Tax cuts. And you'll go back to that. I mean, you will, as, as of necessity, because that's what you can grab as a hook and then, uh, and then build on. So one of the things that I think the party needs to do is to lay groundwork, obviously, intellectual groundwork, and including back to the basics on some things. You know, Republicans are for, are for markets. We're for markets. Well, the American people listen to that and they think, OK, well, they're not for people. They're for markets. They must be for those Wall Street guys. And, no, we are for the American people, and we want to deploy, deploy market forces because they are the single most powerful way to make this nation stronger and better. But we haven't explained that to people, including our own young, for too long. So, I mean, we need to do that, to, to, to build that, that sort of base so that you can convey a message which is driven by a reliance on things other than checks from the government that will be successful. And that's a hard case to make ad hoc on the fly, and I think we learned that. Mm -hmm. uh, in many cases. So I, I don't even know if that answered the question. Very much so. I've, I've exercised another demon, and I thank you. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> this therapy session. I didn't know what um, let me just post quickly to, to Jim and, and Rehan the question of a messenger and context, which is simply maybe, Jim, given your historical perspective, too, you might posit a little bit on the personalities as we think about the future 
um, you know, Palin, uh, Huckabee, who you know well, uh, you know, Chris Pawlenty, Jindal. There's there's a number of individuals who who might be the messengers in the future. Just talk a little bit about that. that. And then Rayhan, I'd, I'd be interested in as you think about this broader context and message. You know, you have written on some of the ideas that I think you and Doug have have, have both talked about. What kind of receptivity do you sense in Republican audiences, either elite or or just or, or, or lay folks in the in the uh, uh, Republican Party to some of these ideas that focus on on appealing to the middle class in a way that the Republican Party is perceived of not doing. Um, Jim? Well, uh, I, I did work on the, on the Huckabee campaign and, and almost a little over a year ago today he was in Michigan for the uh, uh, and gave a speech to the Detroit Economic Club uh, in which he said, you know, a, a great nation needs to be able to feed itself, fuel itself, and fight for itself. The food, obviously, was you know, self-sufficiency in agriculture. Fuel was energy independence and fight, you know, arsenal of democracy, uh, you know, weapons. I mean, I think one of the things that shaped uh, all of our thinking was talking to uh, Duncan Hunter, who was the <coughs> then congressman, uh, who was the uh, former chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, uh, saying, you know, one of the reasons we're having so much trouble, we had so much trouble in Iraq, is we couldn't get armor plate uh, that would uh, be impervious to an IED. Mm. And you'd think that the chairman of the Armed Services Committee would have some influence on that, but it took, you know, four years to get this done. And that speaks to the kind of gross neglect, gross decay, whatever you want to call it, of the manufacturing belt. The, you know, we went to the plant where they built the, the Ypsilanti, Michigan plant, where they built the B-24, I think it was. Or the B <coughs> anyway, I mean, it was quite a sight to, to see a plant that at one time had 45,000 workers and now has, then had 1,000 and who knows what it has now, I mean, maybe zero. Uh, um, and, it's, and to think about the decline there. And I, and, and, I mean, Huckabee had, and I, you know, and it, it Doug alluded to it, uh, uh, you know, an intuitive sense of manufacturing. You know, I mean, uh, 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 you know, he said, and then one of the debates in, in, in Florida, he said, look, we could have this tax rebate, we could do this tax rebate, but it's just gonna go to buy stuff that then goes to China. Uh, why don't we instead take the same money and add two lanes to I-95 going up from Florida to Maine? You know, infrastructure, jobs, uh, you know, and so on. I mean, that, that we could argue about the merits of a lot of different infrastructure projects, and, you know, I'd put in a vote for bullet trains, but nonetheless, <clears throat> this the notion of thinking differently about this and, and, and in, a, in a commonsensical way to the American people, which then, I, I guess, to answer David's question, what Republicans need to get at is where does wealth come from? And it comes from making stuff that other people buy. And it's not printing money, and it's not bailouts and capital injections and liquidity and so on. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a, a complete anti-Keynesian here, but I think the same Bob Samuelson has meant before just said quite cuttingly a couple weeks ago, look, you got to have high added value export industries, period. If you have that, then you've got a good economy. If you don't, then you don't have much of anything except, printing, except the Zimbabwe economy of, of printing money. Uh, uh, and so I, I would just say to Republicans, look, can we get in the game of whether it's Joe the plumber or the forgotten man and so on, all the small business, you know, the, the Ayn Rand's, John Galt, all the people who work hard and make something that adds value and creates jobs, that's the future heart and soul of the Republican economic message. And I would call upon all Republicans to say, listen, are we doing everything we possibly can within the realm of environmental protection or worker safety and so on, to make sure that if somebody's got a, a, a bright idea for a better mousetrap, that he can build it here as opposed to India or China. Very good. Right, huh? um, So the question is about receptivity, and I promise I'll get to that. But sure. I, don't, um, I don't necessarily agree uh, with, with Jim's kind of framework regarding the economy. I do agree, however, that the issue of uh, wages is an important one. I mean, I think a lot of folks in New America talk about this idea of, are you going to choose a high subsidy, low wage economy, or a low subsidy, low wage economy, or do you want a high wage, uh, low subsidy economy? Uh, you know, this idea of the economy of mid-century, where actually, you know, you had a lot of middle class prosperity, where inequality was being combated by, you know, uh, the Kuznets curve. They were just kind of market forces that were working on behalf of, you know, kind of the non-college majority at that time. And I think that that's a real 
source of anxiety when you look at the 90s productivity boom, you know, where has it gone? Was it a one-off thing? How do we sort of gin that up again? Because that's going to be the ultimate source of our prosperity. So I think in that regard, I think that, you know, uh, Jim and I uh, agree. Um, one thing that was very frustrating to me and, and about this kind of receptivity idea is the way that the Joe the Plumber phase of the McCain campaign really repudiated a lot of the hallmarks of kind of center-right economic policy. For example, the EITC was a center-right idea. If you look at the child tax credit, it was introduced by Newt Gingrich and the uh, Contract with America, you know, right-wing radical revolutionaries. And, uh, you know, then there was this idea that, you know, such tax credits were, were socialism somehow. And so, you know, Doug was talking about how tax cuts are the Republican brand. But actually that got very muddied this time around because tax cuts are the brand, not necessarily marginal tax cuts for, you know, kind of folks in the, the top bracket, right? So actually, Republicans wound up being outbid when it comes to the median voter. Now, that's not necessarily a good or bad thing, but I mean, it does complicate the politics rather a lot, because as far as lots of Americans were concerned, again, they had, a, they had more money, they were better at breaking through their message to the electorate. Actually, it's the Democrats who are promising you and your family the tax cut that's going to make a difference in your life. Um, my optimism comes from the fact that, you know, I don't have a lot of faith in the House Republicans or anything like that, but listening to Boehner, listening to the Republican stimulus package, they have ideas like increasing the size of the child tax credit. Maybe not as much as I'd like to see them do it, but I mean, that's an idea that's there, and that's an idea that people fought for and that Hill staffers used to be very, very hostile to because they knew the Wall Street Journal editorial board was hostile to it. And, uh, you know, in the Romney campaign, ideas like, uh, you know, uh, income tax splitting and a larger child tax credit were shot down by, you know, kind of lots of the very sober, very impressive economists were on that team, and, you know, fair enough. Uh, this also happened on the Giuliani campaign, sort of, et cetera. There was a kind of herd mentality on this stuff that I don't think appreciated the way that the politics of tax cuts have changed. Um, and if you look at climate change, I think that's another area uh, where actually kind of sane, sober conservatives who face up to the fact that this is real, this is pervasive, and you don't want to look like someone with your head in the sand. You want to look like someone who has constructive, workable alternatives. So in that regard, I think there's been a lot of receptivity. The thing is that it's taken a very long time, and I, I honestly think that we're in a 30-year phase. I think that we're in a phase of, uh, you know, Doug mentioned education reform. And I think that when you look at Generation Y, look at these folks who went overwhelmingly for Obama and who might be with him for a generation, <laughs> half of that generation is not going to college, or they're going to have some college, but they're not going to have college degrees. And their economic fate is incredibly important. And you can't just say, well, tough luck, guys. I mean, you screwed up. You, you made a bad call. I mean, there are economic opportunities for non-college folks, and we need to improve, you know, kind of the way that our education is shaped so that we're not funneling everyone into a one-size-fits-all model. I think that's a huge area of opportunity for Republicans, in part because the Democrats, there is a way in which they're kind of locked in their own kind of intellectual trap, in terms of their own kind of sensibilities, in terms of their own constituencies, higher education being one constituency. So I think that, you know, uh, when Doug was saying that the key thing is to become receptive to new ideas, to blow things up, does the payroll tax make sense? If you were designing it from scratch, is that what you would do? Of course it's not. So I think that, that we have the luxury of thinking that way now. Very good. Very good. Thank you, Rand. We're going to now open it up for, um, for questions. I'm going to start. We have a few folks in the press here. I'm going to start with any questions from the press, if, um, if there are. And Aaron's got the, um, uh, if you, Aaron's got the, uh, the microphone. Just identify yourself, Robert, and, and, and then uh, ask your question to Doug or whomever. Hi, Robert Schlesinger with U.S. News and World Report. A couple of you talked about the GOP moving past this idea of, of the GOP re-embracing ideas and moving past the notion of well we have common sense down home values so we don't need to be we don't need to have ideas uh, where do you see uh, Governor Palin specifically but more broadly the kind of the number of leaders you mentioned uh, fitting into that kind of debate thanks Robert Doug you want to well um, I haven't really thought about it but I mean one of the things that uh, you traditionally get when you uh, move to a party whose leadership comes out of uh, governors uh, is you get some diversity of ideas. It's a tr just a traditional capacity to tap uh, the things that have worked in their states and uh, the, the sort of unique histories a lot of these states have. So I think uh, that's a step toward that. I mean, uh, we, we ran a, a, a very interesting campaign because we had these two senators running. I mean, it was by historic standards a very unusual uh, uh, situation. and. You know, we're going to go back to a place where I think more ideas will come to the table because of that. Um, I think the second thing is, you know, we have uh, a, a lot of, you know, very, very talented uh, politicians in the Republican stable. I mean, 
uh, the list that David went through, the, the Chris, the Palins, the Plenties, the Jindals, um, you know, it, it goes on. Th these are all very promising figures for the national stage, um, and I think that's, that, that bodes well for the, for the party, quite frankly. And, you know, Sarah Palin got uh, most of the attention, and that's appropriate because she was uh, on the ticket, but I, I think the, the attention has been somewhat mischaracterized. I mean, the, so the two things about Sarah Palin that I don't think have been adequately appreciated are, number one, you know, if you look at the numbers, you know, she really wasn't that different than Barack Obama in terms of experience and uh, time in office and, and issue sets like that. The real big difference between the two is she hadn't campaigned nonstop for two years. And had she campaigned nonstop on the national stage for two years, she'd have been just as polished as Barack Obama. She's a phenomenal politician, and there's no better retail uh, politician on the planet than Sarah Palin with a microphone in front of a crowd. So I think the big experience gap was the one that is about running on a national ticket. And he had a lot more experience there, and uh, it showed up, and that I don't think that adequately got, uh, played out. And the second is that most of the Sarah, Sarah Palin um, sort of uh, intellectual uh, stance issues came from her defenders. And it was the defenders who said, we don't need a vice presidential candidate who's smart, which was just wrong. You do want a vice presidential candidate who's smart. It's a hard job. I want smart presidents. I want smart vice presidents. I'm for that. Uh, she's smart, but the defenders came across with the, nah, we don't need that. And that's a mistake, and it's wrong. It's not fair to her, and it's not right about the job. Mm, nice. Yeah. Jim, do you have a thought? Yeah, I just, <clears throat> just uh, 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 quickly, I would say one, one big function is, you know, it, it, when you're in power, there is a natural tendency toward, to put it bluntly, Kool-Aid drinking, and, uh, you know, uh, just worship of the leader. Uh, and Bush, I think, accelerated that tendency with this sense of moral clarity and gut as being the defining things. And he set a tone, as I, as I agree with Doug, uh, for much of the Republican intel and conservative intelligentsia. Well, if Bush doesn't really worry about the facts too much, but just goes with uh, his instincts and higher power and clarity and moral clarity and so on, then that's all we need too. And that is ac actually not, again, nothing to do with the traditional uh, conservative uh, 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 canon. Um, and I would just say that, you know, in, in the week now that uh, that the Obama administration has been in power, you're already seeing it. Look, if you know things that the Democrats were against, they're now for because Obama's for them. I mean, in other words, it, it, so there's a loss of intellectual integrity and, frankly, IQ points when your party's in power and you have to stick to the party line even when you know better. Okay. Any other press questions, or if not, we'll um, Aaron. You want to bring the microphone? And Question and I'll go to the gentleman here secondly. Oh, hi, I'm Laura Krauss with CBN News. And okay. you talked a lot about um, the need for the Republican Party to lay a strong intellectual groundwork and also the difficulty in, in conveying the message. But um, what do you think the most effective, say there is a strong intellectual f groundwork, mm -hmm. how is the best way to convey that message to the American people? Is it with more politicians, the technology? How do you mm -hmm. see that happening? Mm -hmm. Uh, oh, I, I'm in, uh, heartily in favor of the all of the above strategy. Um, uh, among other things, you know, we've now lost the youth vote three straight elections and run the risk of having a generation never explore ideas. So we have to uh, reach out actively uh, to uh, the youth of America and explain Republican ideas and what conservatives stand, stand for. And uh, that's uh, an educational task that you know think tanks and and uh, the sort of traditional intelligentsia I think need to take seriously. They should not just sit, I think you said sit and talk to each other. That's a mistake. That they need to go educate. And um, second thing is politicians are great vehicles for that education. Their campaigns, uh, their explanations of their their stances. And so it is would be a good thing for Republicans to run 50 straight strategies, 50 state strategies where we run the most conservative person who can win in each district. The person's going to look really different in New York State, uh, particularly on, uh, in New York City, than they will in Texas. But we need to embrace that. Uh, in the process, we will uh, explain to a broader swath of Americans what are the core values that unite us uh, and, and tolerate the differences that you need to, to run successfully in those different environments. Uh, 
Interesting comparison, Sheldon Adelson, the casino mogul, invested a huge amount of money in a project called Freedom's Watch, which he intended to become the alternative to MoveOn.org. Freedom's Watch recently folded uh, after burning through a massive, massive amount of money. Whereas if you look at Move On, it's an, it's an interesting group, quirky group that is flawed in many respects, of course, but, but the thing is that they're a learning organization. They're very responsive. And what they did is they basically found, or this is the Matt Bai theory, they basically found lots of Democrats in heavily Republican areas, people who just wanted to be part of a community. They joined it, and then they have these meetings where they're determining what are your priorities, what do you care about, and they come. Every one of these house parties, virtually everyone, came out with three priorities: uh, health care for all, uh, ending the war in Iraq, and uh, also you know kind of uh, some kind of green energy notion. And if you look at uh, organizing for America, which is the Obama campaign's you know form, you know, the new form that it's taken, Obama for America 2.0, as they're calling it, part of the DNC their priorities are exactly the same. And that was something that actually sort of came from not you know, the, not the whole Democratic primary electorate, but from this kind of activist component. But again, these were people who were embedded in conversations uh, in neighborhoods. They were sort of encountering people who had a different political coloration for them. This is, this is the stuff that actually really got people going, got them motivated. Freedom's Watch was completely top down. It wasn't actually doing that. So that's, when you look at the success of the Huckabee campaign, it was a kind of quirky success, and people didn't see them as viable at all. I remember I worked uh, at NBC, and then my my colleagues, you know, I said, you know, Huckabee is going to be a major, he's going to be one of the top three candidates, definitely. This was, you know, kind of way early. And they laughed. They found the idea wildly implausible. But of course, he raised the small donor, donate. I mean, he ran this amazing campaign that was completely at an angle to the kind of conventional orthodoxies and movement conservatism. Whether or not you agree with him, he was able to kind of tap into that energy and excitement. And of course, that base is a lot smaller, you know, uh, than it is on the, on the D side. But I mean, I think that idea of this interactivity and actually going out to people, what is it that you care about? What is it that motivi motivates you? What is the unifying grievance? And the thing is that we can talk till we're blue in the face about what we think the Republican gestalt should be, but what's going to happen is there's going to be some misstep on the D side, and there's going to be some unifying grievance that's going to activate people, mm. perhaps in ways that we don't necessarily like, but it's going to get people motivated enough that they're going to start actually listening and responding to things. That's the way that these things work. It was the Iraq War. It was the Democrats saying, no, we are not going to cooperate on any kind of bipartisan solution for Social Security. We're just going to say no, 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 and that resonated with people. So that's actually one thing that I think those of us who are into ideas have to come to terms with. Um, it's reactive. Right. I, I, I agree with uh, whatever, what's been said so far. I would just add another uh, camp, and I, as much as an admirer as I am of the Huckabee campaign, I would say an even, even better example of what Ray was talking about was the Ron Paul campaign. Uh, you know, uh, uh, unbelievably motivated, uh, donor rich, but also every one of them had a manifesto, every one of them had an agenda, every one of them had read a bunch of books they wanted to share with you. And, you know, that, out of that comes cadres. You know, uh, the, the, you know the, the, the Christian coalition, you know, I mean, Pat Robertson didn't get very far in 1988, but Robertsonites took over the Republican Party in 20 states afterwards. Uh, we'll see how the Paul people do by comparison, but I suspect, again, there's gonna, at, at minimum there's going to be ferment. At a maximum, um, there's going to be, a, again, I'll just go back to this bailout stuff. If you put a, a trillion dollar fact on the table and say this is a bailout that mostly goes to Greenwich, Connecticut, Connecticut and Manhattan, and, and, and I applaud the work of ProPublica, the, 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 the muckraking uh, journalism group, uh, for, for, for doing so much of the data on this, uh, there is going to be a huge backlash. If you didn't get a bailout, if you don't live in New York or California or North Carolina, uh, you're going to eventually figure out you've really been screwed. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the gentleman, you had the next question, and then we'll go to Danny. Thank you. Uh, I'm Colonel Dick Class, Air Force Retired, a consultant here in town. Uh, just to give Greg something else to worry about in constituencies, uh, in 04, McCain, I'm sorry, um, Bush beat Kerry by 30 points among veterans, veterans who count for about 15 percent of the voting population, not including their families. This time, McCain only won by 10 percent, and that was all over 60. That actually Obama won the veteran vote under 60 by a couple of three percentage points. Um, and that's because the Republicans under Bush treated uh, veterans terribly, even before uh, the folks started coming home from these wars. But my question is this, the, the, the name of this uh, get-together is rebranding, mm -hmm. not renewing, not remaking, not redoing. And there seems to be a split between Greg, who laid out a, a agenda, a new agenda for the Republican Party, or at least a revised agenda, which some of us could call <coughs> Obama-lite, 
Um, and yet Jim seems to want to uh, do what uh, Greg advises not to do, which is you be mean, uh, Doug, here. Doug. I'm yeah. sorry. Be totally negative uh, and oppose, 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 and underneath hope that uh, the Obama policies fail. So that seems to be just putting, to coin a phrase, uh, new lipstick on the pig, uh, as opposed to um, coming up with a uh, revised policies on the party. So I guess my question is, um, who's right? Which way do you go? Provocative question. Doug. Well, I'm right. I'm yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and I have the mic. There you go. So, um, so first thing uh, that, I, that I guess a point I'd like to make is um, the scene that, that um, was described about me debating Austin Goolsby and having Austin constantly massaging and shifting things was, was a scene played out uh, in, in a million different ways over the entire course of the campaign and, and played out by uh, the, the candidate himself, who was going to filibuster the FISA bill and voted for it, who was going to, I used to have a list of 77 things I could describe. You know, but I mean, um, the basic issue was Barack Obama wanted to be not George Bush. And he was running on not being George Bush. And he, in the primaries, was more not George Bush than was uh, Senator Clinton. And one of the downsides to that is he's now the President of the United States, and he didn't run for anything, really. He didn't say, this is my signature initiative. I want it. It will. It was, I welcome your ideas. I. Uh, want to, to restore uh, trust in uh, the government, and there's sort of some vague generalities, but unless you run on something and have people vote for it, you don't have the mandate to do it. He's about to learn that, right? I mean, he, it, it is really striking. So um, I don't think it's possible to be obama light because Obama was a lot of things. Uh, I'm all for being for things and being quite definitive about them and building the intellectual foundation, not for just why they're important to people. We know they're important to people. We just go ask them. I think that, that point's been made clear, but how do you solve their problems in a way that's respectful of their rights and gives the government a supportive role uh, and, and not a handout role? And, and so I guess one of the things that that is, is emblematic of the difference about how I think about this is, is the tax cut debate. The tax cut debate started when marginal tax rates were 70 percent in the United States. They were absolutely a knife in the heart of anybody who wanted to, to get ahead. They were uh, an anchor on the, the prosperity of America. Uh, it was a, a crime against economic common sense. And that case uh, was made in a very articulate and intellectual fashion through the 70s into the 80s, and the, and the taxes got cut. It was about how taxes interfered with markets and how it interfered with the, the efforts of Americans who get out of bed every day and go and try to get ahead and interfered with entrepreneurs and interfered with the things that have made America very prosperous. It wasn't about who got the biggest check from the government. It was about the intellectual foundation of how this economy works. The tax cut debate now is not about that. It's about who gets the biggest check from the government. That's what's wrong. We need to be for the kinds of things that made this economy great and a government that delivers uh, support for those things, not before the, the government that sends the biggest checks. Because in the end, when things fall apart, as Jim predicts they will, the, the, the answer will be we need to, to blame the government again. And, and those who are in power are going to be responsible for that. So I think we need to, to be for things. I wouldn't describe them as obama -lite. I would describe them as uh, market-based and, uh, and responsive to Americans' needs. And, and you know, that doesn't mean get, getting rid of government anymore. It means taking the, the pieces that the Americans have decided are appropriate for government to do and do them right and do them well. Mm -hmm. Ray Hunt and Jim. So when I get the mic, what does that mean? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <means I'm> <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, th that was a, a, a very uh, a, a useful question. Um, I just uh, look in terms of the Republicans, whether it's brand or identity or policies or agenda, whatever you want to call it. When you're out of power, and really out of power, uh, like we are now, uh, you're inherently reactive. Look, if, if Obama, if everything in the Obama administration works, you know, he sails to re-election and, you know, Republicans are in the minority for a long, long time. That's just the way it goes. He, he's got the whip hand uh, uh, now. I mean, I think he's making some huge gambles. I mentioned uh, the climate change and Kyoto before. I touched on abortion. I would also say on Homeland Security. 
you know, you, 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 you peel back the Patriot Act and you let everybody go out of Guantanamo and so on. And, you know, it, I mean, it, it is a, just a fact that 61 Guantanamo releasees are now out there being terrorists again and so on. And two of them are on videotape from Yemen. I mean, that's pretty horrible. And, I, it, you know, it's, it's the war in court on, the, on a worldwide scale. And I don't think it's going to play very well. But that's, again, it's, it's up to the voters and, you know, to, to, to make those decisions. I would just make one point, which I, I think I've touched on, and, and, and maybe this is where Doug and I disagree a little bit. I'm not sure that markets are the final arbiter of what makes a country succeed. I think it's national strength. And I don't mean that in an aggressive way. I just mean the ability to def defend yourself. Uh, every 30 or 40 years, every country in the world just about has faced a mortal threat to its existence from some neighbor, some rival, some enemy, some predator, some somebody. And you have to be ready for that. And, and so I think that, that the, the real conservatism, the real republicanism, admittedly under different party names, going into the past was from Alexander Hamilton, you know, and Henry Clay, and then, and then the Republicans like Lincoln and, and, and T Teddy Roosevelt and so on. And even through Franklin Roosevelt, who was obviously not a Republican, who just understood that, again, if you're running deficits, if you're having big government, you better get something valuable for it. You better get the Erie Canal. You better get railroads. You better get uh, the telephone system. You better get rural electrification. You better get uh, you know, proper education and literacy and, and sanitation for your population. Those are the things that matter most. Uh, I think that, I mean, any, any veteran would say, you know, that. Uh, having proper weapons and proper technical military capacity to win a war not fought at discretion, not fought for the purpose of transforming the world, but for self-defense, uh, that comes first. And when I read that the, and again, this is just, you know, at the, at the rumor level yet so far, that, you know, the, the Obama administration wants to do away with weapons in space, you know, as, and, 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 you know, peel back the arms race. Well, again, I guarantee India, China, Japan, they're not going to do away with weapons in space. I mean, if we're if we're looking at some galactic Pearl Harbor, you know, uh, uh, you know, five, ten, twenty, thirty years from now, because we were, you know, court martialing with Billy Mitchell when the when the Germans were promoting him, or the equivalent over there, um, I think that's a huge thing, and it's much more important than the state of the market, or for that matter, tax rates. Mm, very interesting. Uh, we're going to start piling up questions here, given the interest of time here. How many hands do I see here? We got four questions. Okay. Five. So we're going to go two here, and then I'm going to let them respond, and then go with three more questions here, and then we may, um, we, may, we may cut it and then have more informal conversation. So starting with Daniel and then the gentleman. Hi, Daniel Mandel, New America. Um, Jim, you mentioned Ron, the Ron Paul campaign, and I'm very interested to hear more of your thoughts about that. He was very much an insurgent figure in the Republican primaries this year. He led his own sort of counter convention. Um, in Minnesota and Minneapolis. And it seems like the Republican establishment was honestly very afraid of this guy. Nevertheless, it seems like the coalition he represents is one that's growing in the US. And it's sort of post, -ide or not post ideological, but sort of post partisan in many ways beliefs is what appeals to the, the rising generation of voters. So I guess I want to know what your thoughts are on. Ron Paul's ideas, his methods, and to what extent he can be incorporated into mainstream republicanism. Okay, we're going to take the second question, and then, uh, then we'll let them respond here. Hi, I'm Gary Carr, and I was a volunteer on the Huckabee campaign and then uh, helped out uh, Doug Holtz Eakin at the convention in, uh, in St. Paul on behalf of the uh, McCain campaign and the GOP convention. Uh, two things that seem to happen after uh, an election. One is um, all the people who are on the outside come down on the battlefield and shoot the wounded. And I think we saw a little bit of that a afterwards uh, from some of the unnamed McCain campaign folks uh, about Governor Palin. And then the second thing that happens is people argue about whether you should be ruled out. And I see, a, I see a little bit of this in, in the panel this morning where um, we have a little bit of, a, well, we need to appeal to all people. And social conservatives might see that as a, you want to undermine our issues and the issues that are important to us. And then from sort of the more economic side, you see, um, you see po folks saying, well, 
really the social conservatives are, are hurting the party and hurting the party brand, um, or perhaps that we need to uh, appeal to also. A lot of argument about you're not, re there was a lot of argument, in fact, about Governor Huckabee that he wasn't really a conservative. Um, and then a, a lot of argument from the social conservatives about how the non-social conservatives aren't really a part of the party anymore. How do you bridge those two gaps so we're not constantly arguing about who should be ruled out of the tent? Okay. All right, so you have questions on Ron Paul and then bridging the gaps. Um, on Ron Paul, uh, I, I've spoken about that. I'll let the others uh, speak more about that. I would just say that I, I read somewhere that his two best fundraising places, zip codes, were Austin, Texas and San Francisco, California. And I think that speaks to, again, I, I mentioned uh, Chris Hayes is the inner Austrian. I mean, look, mm -hmm. anybody who has sort of drunk deep on information technology and information wants to be free and all this stuff has an inherent skepticism to big government and you know all, all its works and so there's just a libertarian ethos suffused in the third wave as <coughs> Alvin Toffler and Newt Gingrich were saying uh, 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 20 years ago. Um, as, as to Gary's question on, on social conservatives, I think that you know there, there is an inverse I think uh, uh, Doug or David might have touched on earlier about center, center left elites and center right country. I mean look it's just if you want to be in good standing in this town, you have to have the proper views on gay marriage and abortion. And it gives you a distortion field relative to what the country thinks on these issues. And, uh, it, it, you know, um, period. I'll, just, I'll stop there. I will say that, you know, the irony is that Huckabee was one of the f few Republicans who immediately said the bailout is a bad idea. I mean, he got clobbered for being some sort of Christian socialist, I think uh, Fred Thompson called him. Um, and he was opposed to the bailout. I, don't know, I have no idea what Thompson's position was, but I do know what the institutional Republican Party's position was. Mm -hmm. yeah. You want to address or no, no need to? But if you um, let me just clear up, I mean, Jim asked this at the beginning, and so just let me say a few words about the bailout and how it figured in the campaign, right. since it's obviously yeah. taken on a life of its own. Um, uh, for those who, uh, have forgotten uh, the the bailout was something that um, then uh, Secretary of Treasury Paulson and Federal Reserve Chairman Bernanke implored the Congress to deliver, and uh, there was no evidence that uh, they were going to be capable of delivering. It. If you did the, the the vote counts, it was they didn't have the votes in the House. Nancy Pelosi had said explicitly she needed Republican participation; uh, they weren't. Uh, even in the Senate where they, there was a presumption that it, it would, quote, go through, that presumption was on the part of the Democrats who had never asked their Republican colleagues. So uh, there was a, a legislative process that was stalled. Uh, the campaign, uh, John McCain, myself, several other advisors, was in New York uh, meeting with uh, outside economic advisors who were unremittingly apocalyptic in their assessment of the situation. Um, and. So John McCain, who, who may or may not be an outstanding candidate, but um, is a, a great person because he runs toward problems. I mean, if there's a problem, John runs toward it to solve it. That's not always a great thing in a campaign, I mean, just as a matter of tactics. But uh, he, he looked at a situation where something had to happen, nothing was happening, and if you wanted to be crassly political about it, as I said earlier, every day that the financial crisis went on was a bad day for the McCain campaign because every American looked at uh, that whatever their barometer of the crisis was, whether there's 401k or uh, the turmoil in the markets, and, and just thought, how did we get here? And the minute they did that, they thought backwards and, and were in trouble. So it is in the nation's interest and the narrow campaign's interest for something to, to, to be fixed, at which point uh, the, the major strategic error that I will uh, have admitted to in the past would agree to is I made the mistake of thinking the bill would help that if you got the bill through and delivered something, it would help the financial markets and thus the economy. There is no evidence at the moment that's true, and there's no evidence that the bill as constructed ever would have worked. But, you know, in that environment, John McCain went back and, and set about to do something which was suspend the campaign and turn into the Ledge Affairs uh, director for the American people, get this bill through the Congress. Ledge Affairs is never pretty, and this was not a pretty process. Uh, it was one that, that stalled immediately at the outset with a, what I view as a, a very unfair, unproductive attacking meeting by the Democrats at the White House. Uh, John McCain managed to, to put it together and ultimately uh, get Republicans to seat at the table. They negotiated a bill. 
Um, and uh, that bill was one that I don't think uh, John McCain, uh, had he not been so instrumental in getting it through, would have loved. But he felt he had he'd made the effort to do it. He supported the bill. And um, uh, the rest is history. The, the bill was not successful. I have uh, a long list of, of gripes about the execution of the, the famed TARP program. So hmm. how the bailout bill figured in the campaign is it was basically a no-win situation. You know, if you, if you stay in New York and let things melt down, very bad. If you come back to Washington and try to solve things and solve them in a bad way, as we did, bad. Um, the only good outcomes are be either smart enough politically or indifferent enough about Americans to just stay out and, and let uh, it go on, or be brilliant enough to get it through and make it work. And uh, uh, both the latter two didn't happen. So uh, the bailout bill was obviously a signature event in the campaign and remains a, uh, an important event. I, I don't disagree with anything Jim said about the current popularity and the current quality of economic policy embedded in that bill. It's been a disaster from the word go. Very interesting. I appreciate you sharing the perspective. All right, so we're going to take three final questions, brief questions if we could, um, from the three hands that I saw. And then I'm going to ask, going down, starting with Jim and giving Doug the last word for them, you know, to respond to the questions writ large, but share anything else that they would, would wish. So let's start with the gentleman here, and then moving across, uh, three brief questions. Yeah, I'm Steve Tellison, New America Foundation and Johns Hopkins uh, University. The, the question actually I had when I was thinking about what people were saying, and a lot of them were saying, well, here's what we need to do, and it would be strategically sound if we moved in this direction or that direction. But what didn't seem to be really getting dealt with is, is the Republican Party as an institution <clears throat> capable of that kind of strategic adaptation? Or is it just simply, I mean, the Republican Party is today what it is. It's institutionalized as a, as a series of interests who are, you know, who own to some degree the party and, um, you know, Jim wants the party to become, you know, to run Henry Clay and DeWitt Clinton in the, you know, uh, in 2012. <laughs> it may just be institutionally this, this party as an organization is incapable of the adaptations that any of you um, want to suggest on it. And if that's true, and I think this happens to parties over time, they become brittle, right? They become so institutionalized that they're incapable of strategic adaptation, and then they, uh, they break, right? Some other party takes them over, or they go into a long period of decline. And so I guess the question is, is the Republican Party as an organization, as an institution, capable of the kind of adaptation that all of you seem to be suggesting for it? Great. Okay. The second question in the middle here, someone had. Hi. Uh, David Blum, unaffiliated. Um, uh, David Brooks once said, and I think on the Jim Lehrer show, that Obamaism is not exactly an ideology but a means of governing. And I ask, where is the competency? If you look at the CPA in Iraq, it was run by political hacks who really didn't know how to run, run things very well. How is, if Republicans want to govern, how will they, will they stop running saying we destroy government from within? How will you run government? That's my question. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. And then the gentleman. My name is Mike Israel. Um, Mr. Uh, Holtz, he can, he's talked about the um, error of Republicans of not tolerating differences. Now, another version of that is demanding uh, conformity, which, uh, many of us view how, how we view the Bush presidency. And um, in national security issues, uh, I, don't, I don't want to go into that, but it seemed to be a, a demand that, that was across the board, especially in the Justice Department and the hiring of the prosecutors, of resisting uh, subpoenas, claiming some kind of executive privilege to, to, to do everything. And uh, that's not what this panel really didn't go into. I mean, is, is that a, a good or bad legacy of the Republicans? Specifically, why not let Harriet Myers, uh, Carl Rove, and, and somebody else just testify? Don't claim it. Say that, yeah, they hired politically. They tried to, uh, they fired the prosecutors for political reasons. They may or may not have thought it was the right or wrong thing to do, but at least it gets it past it. What they've done now is extend the issue and becomes a, a legal issue of resisting uh, subpoenas. Okay, thank you. So. We've got questions on the party making strategic changes and in, in its ability to, to uh, make the kind of strategic discussions and decisions we've talked about, competing um, the competency issue about running government, and then in this, this broader piece on subpoenas. You've got three great questions. You've got a, a 90 minutes of things to reflect on. Um, Jim, take any uh, that, that strikes you, or, or uh, and then we'll okay. go down to Doug. Um, well, on, on the can the Republican Party change? I mean, of course, the RNC election is this Friday, uh, so we'll have a early indicator of, mm. of how much change there is, and, and, and I'm, I'm optimistic there will be change. 
Um, I, I think that the history of this, the people who make up the two parties is they are ultimately kind of pragmatic. And as far as my reading history says, they've changed positions on virtually every issue from the gold standard to civil rights to tax cuts to tariffs. I mean, at one time or another, they've had the opposite position from the, where they are now. And so that speaks to kind of a pragmatism, which is, in your words, Steve, is loose and flexible and not brittle. And so I, I see no reason why that uh, uh, can't continue. On, on the running the government uh, uh, question, I agree that, you know, you've got to have competent people. I mean, it, it's, you know, you, you know, we've all touched on this to one degree or another. If you, you know, celebrate people on Wall Street who make $50 million a year who then turn out to be, you know, Ponzi schemers, and you, you, you neglect or disdain people who are actually in charge of making the, you know, roads and schools and everything else work, uh, you get a result. It's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's in economic, it's a matter of inputs and outputs. You, you get what you pay for. You get what you, you get what you demand. Uh, you know, you can look around the government and see islands of excellence and, you know, the military and the public health service and OMB. And one of the things they seem to have in common, by the way, is they have a sort of almost a, uni, like literally uniforms. I mean, it's, a, you know, it wasn't that long ago that, that the public sector was, had uniforms. Uh, you could know who you were. You had a certain pride in it. Uh, I remember going to the Postal Museum in France, in Paris one time, and I looked at the uniform of a letter carrier in 19th century France, and it was quite spiffy. I mean, you would have real pride in delivering the mail if you got to wear that uniform. And, and uh, I'm not advocating that in the, in the current context, but I, I think we have to explore ways whereby uh, people who do a good job, and I think a lot of it has to do with information technology. I mean, surely nobody can argue and look at the way we're doing things now, you know, whether it's spending or appropriating, and think we're making the best use of, of IT, IT possible. And it was interesting. I mean, you know, uh, Obama campaigned hard on a, on, uh, on a chief technology officer, and here we are. We've named, you know, the deputy undersecretary this and that, and no, as far as I know, no CTO. Uh, you know, I mean, you think that would be more important than, than, than a lot of the stuff, not not less important. Um, and then the transparency stuff. Look, nobody. I don't think anybody up here is going to spend much time defending Carl Rove and, and Harriet Myers. Um, I say, I say, let them testify. You know, I, I, I you know, I, I reject Cheneyism when it comes to this sort of uh, uh, approach to governing. I think it's it's so self defeating that it, you don't even get the life cycle of your own presidency before it, before it's undone. Uh, you know, Bart Gelman was here a few little while ago to talk about how even Bush had enough of Cheney by the end of the administration, and and, and, and so on. I will say, you know, on this U.S. attorney's business, you know, I, I mean, it was a masterpiece of mishandling. Uh, there are 93 U.S. attorneys, and it's typical for presidents to fire all of them at the beginning of their term, and I suspect that Obama will, you know, uh, uh, get rid of most or all of them pretty quickly. And I don't, never quite understood how this became such a big scandal, but I'm more than happy to see Rove testify before the Judiciary Committee to explain it. Um, I think Steve's question is, is very interesting and very deep uh, because I think that, you know, part of it as a question is, is there progressive deterioration? I mean, there's a historical process at work, and the fact that the Republican Party has been able to adapt historically doesn't necessarily speak to what's happening right now. And I think that that, that is a puzzle, and I don't think that, you know, I have uh, an answer to that. I do think that... Um, you know, political parties, because they're in a kind of competitive marketplace, are necessarily purposeful organizations. They exist to win, you know, election X or Y, and they're also, you know, so ideally they're learning organizations. When you look at the CPA in Iraq versus the military, the military learned over time. The military learned over time because, you know, they actually had had to do things, whereas the CPA, I mean, sort of, you know, or like, you know, when you look with, within the green zone, you know, the argument I heard from friends were there is that they just started knowing more about what they thought they knew. You know what I mean? They sort of, you know, developed, they were able to routinize processes. And this goes to this broader kind of Mansur Olsonian question. Um, and, you know, kind of do, there's going to be an appetite for something outside of the moderate liberal consensus embodied by, you know, this, uh, this administration. And so is the Republican Party the appropriate vehicle for whatever that kind of alternative coalition is as that coalition changes? You know, and my sense that there is still enough capacity for it to learn and change, but I think that the 2008 election is certainly strong evidence against that proposition. I will say that in 2004, you know, you saw Bush, who was, you know, kind of in some ways really cutting against the grain of kind of that sort of older coalition. Uh, you know, the, there was, you know, in the tri-state area, there was real overperformance by Republicans. You saw the kind of inklings of a kind of changed coalition, and you, you saw the sharpened tendency toward being this coalition of non-college whites, et cetera. 
So I think that, you know, and, and that was stuff that was happening not in any kind of level of grand strategic design. It was really just, you know, kind of where are the ducks, you know what I mean, and where the, what are the kind of subtle things that we do here and there. So I, I absolutely agree that it's not going to be a kind of top-down way that we're going to rebrand the Republican Party because there's going to be an idea czar, you know, at the RNC who's going to end up doing this. But I do think that, you know, it is a matter of, as Doug was suggesting before, you know, 50 states, part of Sarah Palin's weakness uh, you know, on the campaign trail was that her most popular issue uh, as governor of Alaska was, you know, favoring a windfall profits tax on oil. <laughs> I mean, this is something that Republicans in Washington, D.C. ardently opposed. She was, she was in this very kind of quirky, different political context. And so, you know, from the edges of this coalition, look at who people are talking about in 2010. They're talking about Meg Whitman or Steve Poisoner in California maybe having a chance to win. They're talking about Rudy Giuliani in 2010. This isn't to say that, you know, I really believe that social conservatism is deep in the party and that's going to be an anchor of the party in a kind of enduring way. But, you know, that's going to inject new things into the bloodstream because there, it is going to be kind of very pragmatic accommodations and responses to things that are going to emerge. And it's going to kind of lend them credibility. And it's going to kind of, again, change the party from the edges. So I think that it will happen, but I don't think that it's obvious by any means. And I think that actually, you know, you do see kind of severe sclerosis. And I don't even know if the Democratic Party is actually, you know, fully kicked it. That remains to be seen. To the competence question, I think that there is another kind of deeper underlying issue here. So you're talking about, you know, the Bush White House. I'd say that actually there is a level of dysfunction in the Clinton White House that, well, we didn't see because they didn't launch a war that they, you know, didn't have kind of phase four operations for. You know, what happens in the grit of the workings of the machinery of government? Uh, most of you guys know of the, about the goldwater Nichols reform of the military that happened in the 1980s. And a lot of people talk about this in the context of government. Uh, what goldwater Nichols did is basically, you know, you saw in the late 70s, early 80s that there was not enough jointness in the military. We were not able to use all of our different tools effectively in order to achieve certain objectives. That was a big, big problem. So they basically reorganized things in functional areas. And also, you know, kind of they forced jointness because you had, you know, commanders in a particular region who, you know, just kind of required a level of cooperation. So you had more interoperability, et cetera. What the heck does this have to do with the world now? Well, look at the Obama administration. Look at Tim Geithner. He was Larry Summers' subordinate, right? But now Larry Summers is in the White House. So, you know, there are going to be clashes of ego. I mean, who's really in charge of economic policy? You know what I mean? You know, the cabinet is people who are both supposed to advise the president, but they're also running bureaucracies. And when you run a bureaucracy, you represent the interests of that bureaucracy. You become its face, its spokesperson. In New Zealand, they had a kind of quirky solution where what they did is they made the minister the kind of responsible, kind of the purchasing agent on behalf of the government. And all the ministries became crown corporations. And the minister said, do X, Y, and Z. And then the crown corporation delivered depending on how they wanted to deliver, they did in different ways, and they actually ended up slashing the size of the public payroll pretty dramatically through this approach. So you can imagine a world in which Obama has, is a diabolical genius who's decided, I'm completely centralizing power within the White House. The secretaries of the different cabinets are meaningless. They have no power. They're just going to be implementing what Larry Summers and what Carol Browner and the other various czars are coming up with. And that's actually not a bad idea. But again, the uncertainty is the problem. You need to know where the lines of authority are. So I think that this isn't just a kind of Bush and Republican thing. I think that this is, you know, kind of government is going to be as big as it possibly can be given different competitive pressures and given a certain level of technology. Uh, I think that this is Tyler Cowen, the you know, libertarian thinker, introduced this idea to me, and I think it, it's pretty much right. And the, where does that competition come from? It's, it's strategic competition with other states and warfare, and it's also market competition. So you, know, you don't let it become too big if your economy becomes sclerotic, et cetera. But I think that you know, managing that divide is something that these guys are thinking very seriously about. Name, you know, by that, I mean the Democrats. Um, so I know that's not kind of the answer you wanted. Uh, as to the, the legal question, I sort of don't have any unique opinion on that, I don't think. But the last word, Doug. So those are hard, <coughs> excuse me, those are hard questions. Um, or generally on the party. Um, so I guess, l let me say a couple things. On adaptation, I don't have anything really to add except that, you know, I, I, historically adaptation takes place and, and parties are about winning. And, you know, uh, I think the, the desire to win uh, will, will force adaptation. Uh, I do think this issue of competence and integrity in, in governance is, is important. And uh, what we've seen in recent years, I think, uh, reflects some of the, the trends that have been discussed today. I mean, first of all, uh, Republicans don't have a deep bench. We do not have enough high quality people to staff over uh, successive years the entire federal government. We don't. And uh, it starts to show. Uh, you layer on top of that uh, a, an historic a uh, mindset that says the, the problem is government, uh, people do not uh, walk in as Democrats do with the pride of ownership 
of, of an agency and a, a desire to have it shine. I walk in sort of in a very different mindset. I mean, I'm here, you know, this is something, you know, we, we talked about closing four years ago, and now I'm the secretary of this, this uh, agency. So uh, it, you have to have a role for government. You have to be proud of it, and, and Republicans need to, to define that role so we can execute effectively. Um, again, you, the, the sort of uniformity of, of mindset, not questioning uh, what comes down from the White House, uh, is, is, is central to this not working well. You know, if you've got a diversity of ideas, and if the White House wants to use the agencies, um, you know, there are some White Houses very centralized. They, they have no interest in, in the agencies. If you want to use the agencies, since you must, if you want to do something of any substantial successful scale, then you uh, are going to have to engage in an, a, a debate of ideas and internally. And, and that would be a healthy thing. If you don't have that, then you've got a, we want X, go do it, and uh, people start doing things just in an unquestioning fashion, you get terrible uh, governance results. I mean, you know, mm. I, I, I know not everyone agrees about uh, climate change at this table, but I don't think there's anything about the Bush administration's censoring of documents that has helped them make their case for their stance on climate change. It's a mm. disgrace. Have the information out, have the debate, and win on the merits. Don't. Uh, a win on the editing process, and, and that's what we've seen, and that's a problem. And um, you know, I, I, as I said, you know, at the outset, I appreciate uh, so many people showing up uh, to hear uh, Jim on a snowy day, and I, and I hope that there was some <laughs> tiny value added uh, <laughs> by my adding my personal therapy to the to the session. Well, that's for sure. It, it, it's a it is a joy to see folks here. I'm grateful that you you come. Please please join me in thanking Doug and Rayhan and Jim. We are adjourned.